on a Saturday evening of the holiday weekend in May 1953, the mother of one of our most active members arrived from Jamaica and was refused entry to Malton Airport. To have been refused entry at any time can be a harrowing experience for anyone. But to have this happen to an elderly person on the day before a long weekend, when immigration appeal avenues are mostly closed, can be doubly harrowing for all concerned. Early Sunday morning, I received a phone call from the member telling me his mother was detained at the airport. What was the problem, mm -hmm. to your knowledge? If the blacks are on it was a white country. They wanted to keep it a white country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have to go back to 1867. So there you're starting to see, well, we have this now, this new Canada, this confederated Canadian country. So right there and then, first thing you do, you look at the national policy with, with John A. Macdonald. You need to unite the country. So that's when you start seeing how Canada started to create this image of this white Canadian nation state. It's like we're Canadian, we need to unite this country, but at the same time, we have this deliberate policy of keeping it white. It's a white man's country. Of course we ought to exclude them, because if they came in great numbers and settled on the Pacific coast, they might control the vote of that whole province. And they would send Chinese representatives to sit here, who would represent Chinese eccentricities, Chinese immorality, Asiatic principles altogether opposite to our wishes. And in the even balance of parties, they might enforce those Asiatic principles, those immoralities which he speaks of, the eccentricities which are abhorrent to the Aryan race and the Aryan principles upon this house. We are in the course of progress this country going on and developing, and we will have plenty of our own kindred races without introducing this of a mongrel race to disturb the labor market. And we ought not to allow them to share the government of our country. So Johnny McDonald, he brings in the Chinese to build the railroad, to unite Canada from sea to sea. We're making Canada what it is. But then you need to bring in cheap labor. So you bring in this cheap labor, but then you're like, oh, you know what? We don't really want you here. We just want you to work. And that's a very important thing to start thinking about when you start looking at the ties between labor and immigration policy. In 1906 and 1910, those two immigration acts were the first time they really had racialized exclusion policies within immigration policy, 1906 and 1910. Those dates are important, particularly in 1910, that's when you first get this idea of climate discrimination. So Canada had a clause in their immigration policy. It didn't say we did not want black people. It didn't explicitly say this is anti-black racism. It said, we have the right to bar you from this country if you are not suitable to the climate. Much has been said about discrimination. I wish to make it quite clear that Canada is perfectly within her rights in selecting the persons whom we regard as desirable future citizens. So 1947, Mackenzie King, our Prime Minister at the time, came out and said, you know what? It is not a fundamental human right of any alien to enter Canada. A it is a privilege. And when you start looking at his diary, basically saying, you know what? I can exclude whoever I want. There will, I am sure, be general agreement with the view that the people of Canada do not wish, as a result of mass immigration, to make a fundamental alteration in the character of our population. Large-scale immigration from the Orient would change the fundamental composition of the Canadian population. If you can't fit in, if you can't quote-unquote assimilate, which is be white, I use assimilate, if you can't be white in Canadian society, we can bar you. And it's my right to do so. And nobody can tell me any different. This is in 1947. 1950, you have PC 2856, so an order in council. That declared for purposes of coming to Canada, who they deem to be British subjects, and we do not fall into that category. We are not British subjects. If you were a British subject, you could move anywhere freely through the British Empire. Freely, anybody. We meet all the royalties when they came as kids at school, waving the rune and jack, you know, and singing God save the queen or God save the king, whatever have you. But unknown to us, for the purpose of immigration to this country, 
we were not British. And when 1952, you have the new Immigration Act. Now, you can get sponsored. If you have a close family relative, regardless of where you're from, you can come to Canada. If I don't have a brother or sister living in Canada, how am I going to get sponsored? So it's a way of Canada saying, yes, we're helping you out, but knowing deliberately that there are certain groups, non-whites, colored, racialized individuals, that couldn't do it. More than 40,000 Italians came in in one year. And three people of color was admitted into Canada. If I want to come into Canada, I have to fill out an application and send it in. And invariably, people like me would get back a reply that I do not fall under the categories of those admissible for immigration purposes. And there have been several cases like that. A lot of them were put in down jail. After I washed myself and offered up my morning devotions, I proceeded to ascend the high hill of the immigration department. No use going to the airport to obtain information or to seek a solution. That officer who signed the order of refusal may be already sitting in some church giving thanks for having done his duty. What about tomorrow? Offices would be closed to give the citizenry an opportunity to enjoy their freedom while our mother remains alone with her freedom in a detention room under the watchful eye of a guard. I would say they weren't doing anything in the community to address that situation. What was happening, they didn't know what to do. I went into the community to a person that I thought was one of the elders of the community, a very progressive person, the name of Donald Willard Moore. He was a tailor, ran a business, dry cleaning and tailoring shop on Thunder Street. He got 10 people together and on a Sunday afternoon in his little store on Dundas, Moses McKay came and sat with us and talked about the Immigration Act. They decided we would set up an organization called the Negro Citizenship Committee to deal with the question of immigration. So Don Moore would now, from this organization, start writing ministers like the Minister of Immigration. I then contacted the Superintendent of Immigration, Mr. Baskerville, at his home by phone and relayed the circumstances. He said he was on his way to church and assured me he would contact me on his return. After waiting a considerable time without hearing from him, I phoned him again. I was told he was on his way to the office at Young and Davenport. Later, he phoned from his office and apologized for not phoning before. Mr. Baskerville reviewed the file of Mrs. Edith Armstrong and then instructed the office of Malton to release her. When I see what he had done with the NCC, so the Negro Citizenship Committee first, and then the NCA, the Negro Citizenship Association, I see it twofold. Right, the political push. But at the same time, when you start looking at what he did for individual black West Indians and how he helped black West Indians come to this country, it's fascinating. I wrote him, I think it could have been September, October, and I was in here in three months time. It was about three months I was here. I was the second nurse to come from the Caribbean and the first from Barbados. In theory, it doesn't seem political, it doesn't, right? It just seems like we're trying to help people. And you see it all the time. But then what happens is he's doing this in a period that is very politicized. When he spoke to the nurses that he helped in the 1950s, some of these nurses asked, how can I repay you? You know what he told them? And this is when you start looking at the political nature of this association. He said, be an ambassador. He said, be an ambassador and be the best Canadian citizen you can be. In 1952, the organization decided that they were going to try and arrange for a trip to Ottawa to speak to the prime minister of the country, who was Louis Saint Laurent at that time. Donald MacDonald 
Secretary Treasurer of the Canadian Congress of Labour, was the person who arranged the, the meeting with the Prime Minister to start with. But when we arrived, we were told that the Prime Minister was not in the city. And we met with the Minister, Minister of Immigration, Walter Harris. And this started off in 1952. And the best date he could get was in 1954. We left April 26 from Union Station. 35 members of the delegation now went to Ottawa to speak with the Minister of Immigration, Walter Harris. When we got there, he was surprised that there were so many people. So there were not enough chairs, so he had to go and scurry around to get chairs to be able to seat us. Donald Moore opened, uh, after he was introduced by Donald MacDonald, opened with his remarks saying, we were here as law-abiding citizens. We bring no sword, no gun, no explosive. Our only weapon is that of reason, justice, and love. So to make these proposals, come peaceful, no issues with that, present them, as I said, on climate discrimination, some of the changes that they want. Small proposals that we wouldn't think were a big deal now. It happens, everything is great, fantastic, they meet. It took 10 months for the government to respond to the brief. Although Don Moore, when he returned to Toronto, wrote several letters to the minister, Walter Harris, and nothing happened, no reply. We got no action out of the government of the day. And it might be, have been symbolic. It might have just been we went and we talked about this, but it's the pressure that the NCA, Donna Moore, and Stanley Grizel and all put on the government by going to Ottawa that really started the ball rolling for this liberalization of black West Indian emigration. So it's no secret that in 54 you have them going in April, 54, going to Ottawa. In 55 you have the opening of the domestic scheme. In some circles I'm known as a teacher, in some circles I'm known as uh, the chair of Metro Toronto Housing, the former chair. In some circles, I am known as the first African-Canadian woman to be elected to the Parliament of Canada. I was born in Happy Hill, St. George's, Grenada. I came to Canada in 1960. I was looking for some place for post-secondary education, and the opportunity came for uh, the Canada Caribbean, uh, came through, I should say, the Canada Caribbean domestic scheme that they would take young women between the ages of, um, I think, 18 and, uh, and 24. Uh, those young women would be given an opportunity to work for one year in the home of a Canadian family. And at the end of the one year, they would receive landed immigrant status. It was black women who were at the forefront for the deracialization of Canadian immigration policy. Not black men, but black women who took the risk of leaving their families and their children, mothers, fathers, to come to a country they knew absolutely nothing about. Others in the group were making decisions on the basis of the names of the place. <laughs> so, you know, people were saying, I think I like that place, you know, Saskatchewan. <laughs> I was very fortunate. When I compare my experiences, uh, with those of some, some of the other women uh, who got into families that were very large, where they were looking for really uh, someone to, to do really uh, serious domestic work. I must say that I have no story like that to tell. We have had a flag. Flags can be changed. Things flag changed be years later. When the government of Canada changed, John Diefenbaker had an overwhelming majority where he won 211 seats to become Prime Minister of Canada. And in his second term, he decided to do something about the Immigration Act. 
You have the baby boom, so all of these things, you need more infrastructure, right? You need more people to fill that infrastructure. Universities were popping up left, right, and center, and you need people to staff them. You need people to man them. And one of the cheapest ways of doing that is taking individuals that A, are British, B, can speak English, C, another country has borne the price of their socialization, so of their education. And you just take the ready-made individuals and plop them in Canada. If you had a skill that was available, if you spoke English or French, you get so many points. And on that basis, you were accepted. And later, they started to have delegations going around the world, recruiting skilled people. And that's what broke open the doors. We start getting carpenters, we start getting nurses, we start to get doctors, we start to get lawyers. Various people start applying because they were qualified. And that had made quite a difference to opening the doors of Canada. And we can see it now at the moment, over 55% of the people that live in Toronto are people of color from various ethnic communities. It's quite a change in the year 2014 to what it was prior to us going to Ottawa in 1954. And so I want to end by saying thank you to all those who've led the way, all those who've made contribution, all those who put the agenda on the table for policy makers to take into consideration as they make policies. With uh, Bromley Armstrong, the CLC um, and uh, the union uh, movement and those individuals that he was able to hone as friends. So you go beyond um, an employee to the fact that you trust it, the fact that you can get into rooms with people where you can make the kind of discussion and where you can be called upon for your expertise. And I think that that was offered to Bromley and that has served all of us in the community well. Her son Bromley was waiting patiently at my home all afternoon. When he got the news of her release, he was off to the detentions hotel and back in a jiffy. He took pains to stop at my house so I could meet his mom. I am sure if Mr. Baskerville was around, he would have gotten a kiss too. <laughs>